I'm Cindy Atherton, and I'll be running the panel today. I am, um, I've just retired as the science program director at Heising Simons Foundation. There is another Heising Simons person in the audience if you want to corner Evan. Um, and I'm an atmospheric scientist by training, so there are bonus points to anybody that works tropospheric ozone into their question or Ooh. comment today. Um, see me after. Uh, today we're going to be talking about nature's contributions, which are vast in climate change, mitigation, adaptation. Um, in particular, we're going to understand how can nature itself help us both mitigate and adapt to climate change. We're going to talk a little bit about the barriers and some of the opportunities in this space right now, which is a wonderfully open space. I would say a relatively new space, as you'll hear from the speakers today. Um, and then I also want to emphasize that there's going to be some terms that we use today. And if you're like me, they had to be defined for you because you didn't come out of the womb knowing what they were. We're going to talk some about nature-based solutions that benefit both people and nature. Um, and that's things like restoring wetlands, conserving forests, having crop covers, and things like that. Things that we kind of know a little bit about and have been working on. Um, and another example is for anybody from Colorado, as my family is, for example, using bushes and not fences to contain blowing snow. Um, so there you go. That's a nature-based solution. Now, if a solution not only helps nature and people, but also impacts climate, either by reducing emissions or sequestering CO2, then we might call that a nature-based climate solution or a natural climate solution. So stay tuned for those. Um, it's going to be a rousing morning. Um, and I'm going to start by introducing our esteemed panelists and thanking them for, for being here today. Uh, immediately to my left is Dr. Jessica Hellman. She is the executive director of the Institute on the Environment at the University of Minnesota. She's also the consortium director for the Midwest Climate Adaptation Center. Phew. Okay. <laughs> uh, next to Jessica is T. Thomas. T is the CEO of Quantified Ventures. Um, you can learn a little bit more about them online, but they design, capitalize, and scale investable, investable that seems like a funny word, solutions in this space. So thank you, T, for being here. And on the far end of the, the days is Sarah Levitt. Sarah is the natural climate solutions. So remember how I said natural climate solutions, it's going to come up repeatedly. She's the measurement, evaluation, and learning lead um, on the Nature Conservancy's global climate team. Um, she's been involved in a number of papers that have come out in this field, including a very landmark one early on. Um, so what we're going to first do is a guided discussion where I'll ask questions of the panel. And then we're going to leave ample time for your questions. And I want to say two things. Number one, we're going to have questions in person. So people in this room, you may stand at the microphone. And people online, we welcome your questions on Slido. Now, a little trick for those of us used to just doing takeout. If you don't want to stand in line and you're in the room, you can still submit your questions on Slido. There's nothing against that. So if you'd rather not stand, and it's not easy for you to stand, please submit your questions on Slido, even if you were in the room. OK. I think we're going to go ahead and start with the panel. Jessica, I'll start with you. Help me set the stage. Um, how is nature adapting to climate change? Um, how does nature help us adapt? And how can we make this more effective? Um, I think given the complexity of both nature and, and humans, um, how do we ensure that enough knowledge, either traditional knowledge or Western-based knowledge, is out there and can specifically help us achieve some desirable outcomes? So kind of teed up a very hairy question there. So let's <laughs> let Jessica spend a few minutes <laughs> addressing that. Well, thank you, Cindy. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you for the National Academies for hosting this conversation. Um, 
And thanks for the opportunity for all of us to talk about this uh, notion of nature-based solutions. I think you're right, Cindy, that this is a wide open topic and it's really, really broad. Um, it's basically our way of talking about climate, the need to stop climate change, the need to adapt to climate, and things related to nature and putting them together. So I uh, appreciate so much that you would open with a sort of some definitions. I very much think about uh, the relationship between people and nature. In nature-based solutions, I tend to work in the adaptation space, so I'm gonna talk mostly about adaptation. When we say adaptation, we mean what is it that we're gonna to do to make the situation of climate change smaller? Of course, we're gonna stop climate change, but we're also going to adjust and adapt and live with the consequences as best we can uh, through adaptation. Adaptation and mitigation, the process of stopping climate change, are related. We're not gonna adapt very successfully to large amounts of climate change, so we need to make sure that it's small. Adaptation relies on mitigation. When we talk about adaptation for nature, sometimes we are speaking of our stewardship responsibilities, our desire to protect nature from its vulnerabilities to climate change. We think about preserving healthy ecosystems, endangered species, the services and goods that we get from nature that humans rely upon, all of the things that we will do to help nature uh, adapt to climate change. I consider those nature-based solutions in part. And then we also deploy nature for our own benefit, uh, thinking about how we need to adapt to a changing climate, issues like flooding, uh, heat islands, um, the needs that will have out, how agriculture will change and our ability to grow food in the future. There are so many places and opportunities where we can use natural ecosystems as techniques in our adaptation. So I often think about helping how nature, how we can help nature and how nature can help us, at least in the adaptation space. And then you asked, how can we, um, like what is the basis of evidence or, or how do we go about pursuing those things. Uh, we, haven't, we have been in the business of managing natural resources and, and creating built systems, often mimicking or deploying nature, natural solutions for a long time, but we have never done that. A society has never deployed that at scale in response to shifting conditions. So we are making it up as we go along, which is an incredibly interesting and exciting place to be an academic, to be a scientist, to be working with practitioners and communities, figuring it out together. Uh, that can be very rewarding. It feels very pertinent and um, is important in every individual's life. But we, at the same time, we are pursuing science as quickly as we possibly can. We're trying to figure out issues of efficacy, uh, cost, um, durability, equity. Uh, we're looking at what we would call co-benefits. That's another word we'll end up talking about. But also always, 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 always side effects. We have to have evidence about what are the side effects and how do we tolerate them. Thank you very much. Um, next, we will turn to Sarah. So Sarah, you've done a lot of ground, on the ground work, both implementing and measuring natural climate solutions um, to mitigate climate change and, and think about adaptation. Can you tell us about some of the realities? Like you're kind of boots on the ground sometimes, and I think you've got important lessons and stories to share with us. So, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Cindy, and great to be here today. Um, so, just to recap initially, as, as Cindy mentioned, I work in natural climate solutions or na nature based mitigation. So, that really comprises actions to protect, improve management and restore natural and working lands across forests, coastal and freshwater wetlands, uh, grasslands, and agricultural lands uh, in ways that either reduce emissions and or increase sequestration. And a lot of these actions overlap with some of the actions that Jessica just mentioned, um, but they have to be deployed in addition to business as usual actions and include safeguards for people and nature. Um, so I wanna make sure I'm really clear what I'm talking about when I speak about NCS. And most of the examples that I'll give today 
come from work that I've been leading the last few years with the NCS Prototyping Network, which is a network of 15 projects across 13 countries all across the globe. Uh, and those projects are focusing in the areas of peatlands, coastal wetlands, and agroforestry, as those were really kind of up and coming topics in the conservation conversation that have large data and information gaps, but also great potential to impact livelihoods and provide co-benefits locally for communities. Um, so as you can imagine, with a, a network of this size and diversity, we've had a lot of lessons learned. Um, for the moment, we've kind of categorized our lessons learned into five areas. The first, which won't surprise anybody, is around community engagement and equity. So really finding that, um, of course, relationship building and building trust with those communities is key. And I think there's an inherent tension that we have to call out with the, the climate crisis and deadlines around 2030 and really needing to deploy action immediately, whereas building trust in a community can often take a year or more. Um, so we have to do that. Our, our solutions won't be successful unless we've built those trust and relationships. Um, but I think there is that inherent struggle around timeline that I, I think is good to just always be cognizant of. Um, and also just recognizing the, the gender implications of conservation work and climate impacts. So uh, employing women and other communities in ways that are inclusive, but also don't have uh, potential unintended consequences for those groups. Um, and also learning that it's really important to engage youth. Many NCS strategies are generational strategies that will need sustainable investment over time. Uh, and as we've seen across the globe, there is a lot of movement from rural areas and sort of traditional production systems into cities for livelihood opportunities. So really building those, those jobs and opportunities and engaging young people from early in the process is super important. Uh, and then also keeping in mind, of course, um, I'm a white American based in the US and in an international organization. And so working cross-culturally in ways that are appropriate and sensitive to the local realities is, is very important. And so uh, a key here is having staff based in country, but also working with local organizations and country uh, and being really humble and thinking about solutions that are going to benefit those local communities and um, are really driven by the needs of those communities. So that's one category. Uh, another category is around institutional, what I would call institutional lessons. Uh, and so many of those are centered around changes in government administrations over time, uh, the unfortunate global increase in uh, political violence and instability, and just general bureaucratic and administrative timelines. And I think often in our project planning, we don't necessarily do a good job of accounting for contingencies around those uh, institutional situations. So really being flexible in how we set up our projects, that there's more than one path to success or more than one path to the outcome that we're hoping to achieve um, and opportunities to break down the work into chunks so we can have successes along the way um, and or advancing successes in parallel. So just really having that flexibility, sort of a project management lesson, um, but also for, for funders and donors and investors being able to have a little bit of that mental flexibility in terms of the scope of projects and how we achieve our goals over time. Um, uh, I have more to say on that that I think I'll bring up a little bit later in the conversation. Uh, and then just to mention briefly the other categories, one is around science and data and information. Um, and there's still huge, huge data and information gaps um, in particular geographies. Um, I think it's well recognized that we have a lot of um, ecological data gaps across Africa, parts of Asia, Asia um, in areas such as peatlands, which is one of our, our focuses. Um, there's still a lot that we need to know even about where peatlands are, where their, what their carbon stocks are. Um, and in some of those places, even some of the foundational basics such as being able to hire technical staff who have the right expertise and training to advance the, the technical side of NCS research and implementation, and even basics such as getting soil samples to labs 
and the time that it takes to get that or even having to go out of country. So some of these just basic foundational research and data needs in, in a lot of places and areas across the globe. Um, and then logistics, as we can imagine, for both researching and implementing projects um, who may be in remote areas that have either limited growing seasons or uh, you know, monsoon seasons and uh, folks who, who work on projects who live in the city, but the projects are deployed in the country. So a lot of just sort of logistical challenges that we have to keep in mind. Uh, and finally, resources. There is only a, a small fraction, a small percent of the investment in NCS and nature-based solutions generally that is needed globally. Um, so really, whether it's philanthropy, private sector investment, or whatever the case may be, we need a huge increase in resources to meet our global climate targets. Um, and on that front, I'll mention one area, which is there's been a decent amount of investment in restoration activities, but where we get the biggest bang for our buck really is in avoiding or reducing emissions in the first place. So making sure we're pairing financing and investment to a whole range of nature-based strategies, not just those in the restoration area. Those 15 examples are really interesting um, around the globe, and you can look them up online if you'd like. And that really tees up our next conversation with T herself about how do we help the financing of these projects? I mean, this is really a new space, and I know you're doing a lot of innovative things there. Can you share with us how does one go about doing some of the fun. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I feel like I'm very loud. Um, can you guys hear me OK? Say. OK, all right. <laughs> the guy in the back is like, I hear you perfectly. <laughs> um, so uh, our company has been at this for about 10 years. We did the first environmental impact bond for DC Water about 10 years ago. Um, and there's a lot of different examples that we can give. but our general way of thinking is a little bit different than um, sort of like you just got to get money in nature-based solutions. We actually started with the kind of radical idea that, that nature actually gives us all kinds of outcomes that somebody cares about. And so how do you, and, and, and also that nature is actually typically your best bang for your buck. Um, so how do you kind of put that good business spin on nature um, so that people value nature. So we did the first EIB, Environmental Impact Bond, in DC 10 years ago. It was green infrastructure was a fraction of the cost of gray, the gray solution. Um, it felt too risky for the city to uh, pull the trigger. So we designed a transaction that put the risk on the impact investors. And we said, however nature performs, you investors will get a little more or less on your return based on, but if it falls apart, you're the one that's out of luck, not DC water. Um, and then of course it overperformed. And then we did that again in Atlanta, and then we did it again in Hampton. And then a couple of years ago, we did a $200 million one in uh, Buffalo, New York. And guess what? People don't really call us for EIBs anymore because it's not that risky. Um, so for us, that is part of the evolution of thinking about good business and nature as not mutually exclusive um, opportunities. So a lot of the work that we have done, whether it's an ag-based fund partnered with the Iowa Soybean Association, where we work to calculate the outcomes of better regenerative ag practices, and then we say, who benefits from this? Well, what we found is that all the big ag people, Cargill and uh, Pepsi and Hershey and Target, they all wanted credits for their scope three target emissions. And then all three levels of government bought the water quality improvement outcomes. So we sold to USDA, we sold to the Iowa Department of Agriculture, and then we sold to wastewater treatment facilities that needed to meet effluent. So th those all sound like, um, kind of like talking about it, you're like, duh, of course that should be the thing that happens. But the way that we kind of currently do business is business. The way that we put money out for environmental purposes is very siloed and very disparate. So a lot of the work that we do in the innovation 
of the way we think about nature-based solutions is how do you calculate the outcomes, figure out who benefits, and then, and then figure out how financing can sort of pull all of those pieces together. And that fund is, has now scaled to almost a half a billion dollars, and it's off and running on its own. It's magical. Um, but it started as the hardest, riskiest thing, and we are now replicating that with a lot of very painful lessons learned in Idaho, California, and Colorado. So it's just this idea of the first few times that you try to make the business case for nature, it's really hard. But um, there are still gaps in data to prove outcomes, but largely we sort of start with, we know a lot. There's been a lot of studying around this. Um, so we try not to come to these conversations saying, what are the problems? But instead, how do we look at the wealth of solutions? And, and really, how do you think about that? So we've done this with um, outdoor recreation and how do you create local business and local economy around nature? So um, many of you may have heard of the Bailey's Trail in Southern Appalachia in Athens, Ohio. This is exactly the financial pieces that were there. Um, Athens, Ohio was post-industrial, absolutely ravaged from an environmental perspective, very um, uh, high unemployment, low um, median household income. And they said, we want to build a new economy. We want to build an economy based on nature. So you can build an economy on anything. There are prison economies where you put in a prison and then you have restaurants to feed the people that work there and laundry that washes the clothes and you can build an economy around anything. And so they said, we want to build it around outdoor recreation. So we financed and they built a first in class mountain bike trail, um, passed with tax incentives locally. And we cut the ribbon in February of 2020, March of 2020, COVID hit and it, of course, as we know, in hindsight, outdoor recreation became a driver for all of us. But through that, we protected a um, huge swath of um, forested land. And then uh, two months ago, I was at a random, totally unrelated meeting, and a young man approached me and said, hey, are you, I'm from Athens, Ohio. I'm moving home. I had moved away, and I'm moving home because it's a completely different town now. So he's like, they're building breweries. We're not the town where people build breweries. So I think a lot of what we do, and I'll, I'll stop here in a second. It's my favorite topic, obviously. Um, but a lot of what we do um, through some of these transactions but is really towards the action side of how do you take the best of what science has given us? How do you take the best of the data? And how do you actually put money on top of that in a way that, that, that has that bias towards, yeah, there are a lot of problems. Yes, it's incredibly risky. But with this sort of internal optimism that, that this is the cheapest thing with the best outcomes, both for adaptation and mitigation. So um, yeah, I'll pause there, um, but kick it back to you. I love that there's like a ripple of positive outcomes. It's not just one positive outcome, but it's a ripple or it's, I don't know, remember um, the circles that intersect with each other when we all had to take Phys 1 and, and it's just wonderful to hear about these. I'm now going to ask a couple questions myself and then I'll pause and I'll urge you to ask questions yourself either at the microphone or on Slido. Um, the first question is, and this is for everyone to answer, um, maybe we can start with Jessica, but I, I'm agnostic as to where we start. So nature is changing because of climate change, right? Um, and how does that impact? How do those changes that nature has experienced impact its ability to provide climate solutions for us? And how do we account for that? I mean, it's a little bit tricky. So Jessica, if you want to start. Sure. Um, well, this, this is complex. And the main takeaway that I would leave everyone with is that we need a lot more research on climate feedbacks and interactions and how we ensure long-term sustainability and, and durability of any nature-based solution. 
Um, I'll mention a few, few of those types of interactions. One, we see in the news every day that increased temperatures and droughts like in the Western US are contributing to fires, which um, are huge releases of, of emissions of greenhouse gases and, and other climate forcers, um, increased pests, and just gen in general with, with droughts, it decreases the ability of forests and other ecosystems to absorb carbon and to be resilient to future changes. So that's one area. Um, a potential positive impact in some places is or CO2 fertilization of basically increasing photosynthesis in, in plants may increase growth in some cases. Um, then we see albedo, which is sort of the reflectivity of land covers. Um, light land covers reflect the, the sun's rays, whereas dark ones absorb heat. Um, and so in certain areas such as boreal areas or dryland areas, we may think that reforestation, for example, is a good solution. But if we're actually in, increasing the dark ground cover in those areas, the, the increased al albedo effect or you know, radiative absorption may actually offset the increased sequestration from the trees in those areas. Um, and uh, maybe I'll pause there with what some of the impacts are, but basically just hearing about even those three areas and how variable they can be across de different ecosystems or different types of nature-based strategies, um, we need a lot more research to understand those actions and how each one might be deployed or might have impacts in, in a given project area. Well, I'll build off of the research. I think that's right. We've, we're developing a sort of cottage industry in uh, climate projections for different species and ecosystems. And there's a lot of methodological improvement. We just had a session on AI. There's a lot of opportunity for building better models that uh, offer better prediction. Um, some important challenges are we're still learning how context dependent, how specific does the answer need to be, how generalizable can some of our principles about how systems are responding to change uh, be. Not surprising, there are some things that are generalizable and some things that are highly spe specific. We do need to understand how nature responds to climate change in ways that we are using nature. So for example, um, an important role for green infrastructure or nature-based solutions in managing climate change would be uh, reducing the urban heat island through street trees. Well, cities, of course, have figured out that maybe the trees that are planted around the city aren't the trees of the future for that city. And so there have been a number of efforts to try to make predictions about what might be future good street trees. And if you think about how trees work, they, turn, they don't turn over all that often. So when a tree comes down or needs to be replaced, you need to think very carefully, what's the tree that's gonna do the best job in this spot for the next 20, 30 years? And so we need to account for climate change when we're thinking about how we use that nature-based solution um, in an urban setting. But flipping this around, I'll, I'll add to this discussion that uh, while we have to account for climate impacts on nature, we also can look to nature for some of its properties that are beneficial under climate change. And one particular uh, way of thinking about that is that many nature-based solutions are quite flexible. They themselves are fundamentally resilient. If you think about, for example, a built infrastructure um, stormwater system versus a nature-based wetlands um, and, and um, you know, groundwater, the possibility for groundwater storage, one has more flex in the system. One is built to very specific uh, um, to certain specifications, the other one tends to be more resilient. So harnessing that resiliency of nature-based solutions is one smart thing to do in the face of a flux, not only is the climate shifting, but it's becoming much more extreme and much more variable. So nature-based solutions tend to fit well in those settings. Can I just add, um, which is like a little bit of a different take on that question, which one thing that we are finding just sort of over the years of sort of preaching to the choir. And um, quite often when you go into a community and in, in, in your head, um, you're talking about nature-based solutions um, and you're trying to talk to like a public works director or someone that has so many priorities, 
Um, they're just imagining kind of birds and bunnies, and they're like, why are you bothering me? And one thing that, I, that we are noticing across the board is where you used to be able to kind of ignore um, nature in a way, like because it was, we are now seeing such intense heat and flooding and drought, and you can't ignore it now in the way that I think we've maybe been able to, it's like a kind of a morose statement, like the way we've been able to sort of get away with it in the past, we kind of can't now. So we have a community in New England that we are working with, and forever we have, whatever, we've had ties to this community. They have a lot of dams, they have a lot of flooding problems, um, and so they would have these flood events that would, and they would be like, okay, yeah, I guess we should, you know, throw in some wetlands somewhere. But really what they need is like to look at their watershed because there's a lot of problems up here, which makes it complicated. Um, but they had a massive flood last year and it wiped out their grand list. That means no taxes, their business district was gone, homes that were worth a half a million dollars are now a fraction of the cost. Who wants to move their home or business to that community. So from a business case perspective, there's never been a better time, like, I don't know, there's probably, it's probably a gross way to look at this, but but it's really becoming less of a fluffy feel-good thing of, um, you know, we wanna hug trees, and which we do, um, but it's more like, hold on, we need to put this to work for us, and it's so extreme that ignoring it is really not something that we can financially withstand just or communities are just gone yeah can i so in addition i'm curious um when you when some of these municipalities you're saying okay well now we're ready to consider the the broader view and the sort of ecosystem perspective is it um i've experienced that sometimes if you turn back to some of the built or sort of highly engineered not nature-based solutions they become too fixed or become potentially too costly if they're overwhelmed. And so there's also this sort of additional risk of implementing some costly built solution that actually might end up being maladaptive, like a levee that can handle a certain flood, but all you need is a flood that's a little bit bigger than that that's and right. it was insufficient. That's right. So not only the, the draw to nature, but also the concern about the insufficiency or maladaptation of potential of some of the traditional build solutions. Have you seen that? That's exactly right. Um, you know, for example, working on pre-disaster mitigation, sometimes these are all euphemisms that it kind of means the same thing, right? Like if we're talking adaptation and pre-disaster mitigation, like depending on which federal program or is this emergency management, is it water quality? <laughs> sometimes the interventions are kind of the same. But working on pre-disaster mitigation, where if you if you do it in advance versus, um, and this was your point earlier, it's so much cheaper to just not do it in the first place. Um, but working on this in Louisiana, um, we found a huge interest in putting buildings on stilts. Mm -hmm. And part of this is like, it's just stranding people up higher, right? It's not really a solution, except maybe less water in the basement, hopefully. Um, so yes, absolutely, where, um, I think where we still struggle is the nexus between all of us on this panel and the AI panel that was just here before. Because yeah. what I don't have is when the when there's um, one of my team members likes to say we never want to let a good disaster go to waste. Um, and so when you when you get that call and they're like, oh my gosh, now we're ready to listen. Give us money. What should we do? Our process right now for really giving a community the best information quickly is like multi-year, like, you know, hydrology studies. So um, I do find um, that the built environment is the bend, but we can't afford it. It's too expensive and it's not doing the job as nature gets more and more insistent on paying attention to it. Um, so that's exactly right. Yeah. I might just add here some of the, the additional benefits that we see from nature-based solutions um, include, for example, water regulation, flood, flood control, as T was just discussing, um, but also water provisioning in, in times of droughts, um, increased soil fertility, uh, support for biodiversity, uh, 
sort of social and cultural services around nature-based um, economies or, or cultural tradition, traditions um, and air purification, among many others. So depending on what type of nature-based strategy you're talking about, it often comes with many of these other co-benefits or additional benefits that other solutions may not bring. And depending on your audience, you may not even lead with the climate angle uh, of the project. You might lead with that water security or food security That's right. angle. That's right. Fascinating. Um, I'm going to ask one more question, but you can tell there is just a lot of opportunity here to learn and to, to better ourselves through this panel today. So I'll ask my question, and then if you want to start lining up at the microphone or do the little um, bypass, submit your question through Slido with the QR code everywhere, um, feel free to do that. So the question I'm going to ask is what are one or two really big opportunities right now that we could be possibly moving forward with and that could be game changing. And I know every child is our favorite child and there is no whatever, but, but are there some um, possibilities that are here now waiting for us to, to seize upon them? Me? Okay. All right. Um, well, so many things that I yeah. want to change the world. Um, I would say kind of two things come uh, to the top of mind. I think one, I think the world of um, kind of the free money way of dressing, of addressing nature, like we kind of need to just get over that as the way to, to do business. You know, free money in, like $1 in and $1 of impact out is almost never going to solve a problem. And so I think a lot of, um, so we work a lot with philanthropic that are trying to have a bigger reach. Uh, we have all these disparate outcomes and benefits, right? Depending on the nouns and verbs and English to English translation, you can get much, you can get, you know, there's transportation sort of funding or there's a whole, you know, there's EPA, there's USDA, there's FEMA. And so thinking about lining up these sort of disparate outcomes, both from, you know, federal and state dollars. But so I think from a financial perspective, a lot of the transactions that we are doing are really, how do you get financing to incentivize funding in a couple of different ways? So it's such low hanging fruit. You get a community that wins a $20 million award and they need to wait two years before that grant money starts going. So that means stuff gets more expensive. The impact continues to happen for two more years. Your local champions move away. The community engagement that you work, work so hard to get in place to begin with starts to wane. So I think financing and that is such like there's no risk. So I think thinking about that play between funding and financing is um, just ripe for just like easy wins. And then I think the other is um, we, we see so many ways of um, again, we think a lot about how you fundamentally think about investing in nature to change clients, um, sorry, uh, climate communities and resilience. So like when you have um, trees, like uh, urban trees that are felled and thrown away because of we're putting in a new road, we have millions of trees that are thrown into a landfill every single year, every single day in every city they're thrown into the garbage. So in Baltimore, in Memphis, in Louisville, where I'll be in a couple of days, how do you create local sawmills, employ local people in these previously under-resourced communities, get actual, turn those into pieces of wood that people care about, and then connect that to you know, high-end furniture sales that care about that. You're valuing nature, you're creating local jobs, and you're, you're reducing your impact externally. So I think, I think private industry that has a positive to the environment is something that we are increasingly leaning into. So this doesn't just feel like something that falls outside of sort of the market, so. That seems to me kind of like a silver lining perspective. Like these are daunting challenges. There's a lot of increasing threat, but there are opportunities to think differently. Oh, absolutely. And do differently. That's actually the thing I'm most excited sort of the greatest opportunity that I see is that confronting climate change is one of the greatest endeavors of humanity and presently we are not doing a very good job of it 
for, to be frank. However, it does cause us to confront things that we have been ignoring for other reasons. As an ecologist and a climate person, the fact that we are putting nature-based solutions on the table, say in an adaptation context, that we could make systems more resilient through deploying nature actually offers the opportunity to reverse some of the biodiversity and ecosystem losses that we have pursued. An example might be uh, in uh, northern Indiana, we did a, a study where um, we're looking for the possibility of wetlands recharging the groundwater where that groundwater would be used for irrigation in drought years for commodity crop production. So that's a story where the broader conversation changed from we need to get water off of this through tile drains and we need to convert wetlands into productive farmland. That's what we did historically. Now the discussion says, uh-oh, we need to worry about extreme drought years. We need a source of irrigation. We should put the wetlands back on the landscape for the possibility of providing an ecosystem service of irrigation. So it, the, a silver lining is that it's causing us to reimagine what we, what we lost in some cases we could put back um, for, for useful reasons as we confront climate and changing climate. Creativity there. So yeah, yeah, we're capable of it. Sarah, would you like to? Yeah, I'll I'll speak to some of the same themes, and and one is just thinking about you know the the time to act really is now. Um, speaking to the mitigation side, currently it, NCS could provide up to about a third of the mitigation that's needed to reach global climate goals and limit warming, but by 2100 that will be closer to only 10 percent. So as emissions increase and, and climate change progresses, the power of nature to mitigate and adapt to climate change will be reduced over time. But the good news is we have all of these opportunities and sort of growing interest. Uh, in my mind, in terms of speaking to different ecosystems, one is really tackling global forest conversion. And then the other is peatlands. As I mentioned before, this has been an understudied area, but huge carbon reserves, huge potential for emissions um, outputs from fires and drying and degradation of peatlands. Um, so really tackling those two opportunity areas, I think will be huge. Um, and, and part of that is the valuation of the benefits of those systems as they are. And then I think part of that is also tying to local economies and livelihoods and and building out jobs and sustainable opportunities for folks who live in those areas. Um, and really also tying that back to, in many places, cultural traditions. Um, so I could give an example in Minnesota, similar to the one that Jessica just gave for Indiana, um, but also thinking to a project that we have in Mongolia, where there's a lot of traditional nomadic herder communities that are, are based on these extensive rangeland systems. Um, and as it turns out, there are a lot of pockets of peat areas that are reserves of, of moisture in times of drought or prevent flooding. And so really preserving and restoring those peatland areas is a way to also ensure the, the traditional cultural livelihoods of those communities in Mongolia. Um, so there's a lot of interaction of all of those cultural, economic, and you know, climate or, or nature-based factors in that situation. All right, we've come to the part of the program where we depend on you for your questions. And I am looking to my colleagues at the Academy. We'll start with a Slido question. Absolutely. Oh, thank you. So our first question from our online audience is, what are the workforce needs for experts in nature-based solutions? Are existing academic pathways sufficient to meet these needs? Can I share a thought about that? I think to answer that question, we do need to go back to those different dimensions and features of what we mean when we say nature-based solutions. So for example, in the uh, adaptation space, there's, uh, I have the good fortune of being part of something called the Midwest Climate Adaptation Science Center. We call that the CASC, C-A-S-C, is a national network of regional centers uh, run by the, and funded by the USGS in partnership with universities, NGOs, tribal colleges, natural resource uh, management agencies. 
Uh, and we are working on workforce. We're working on research and science collaboratively, but we are also working to build future natural resource professionals that we say are climate ready. Mm -hmm. So they are prepared to uh, put into practice adaptation solutions, also to deploy nature-based solutions for mitigation as well. But young professionals or early career professionals, actually we're doing retraining as well, all professionals, um, being prepared to sort of ask the climate questions and to be knowledgeable about the natural resource management tools that are available to achieve some of those goals. Uh, I'll let others talk about, I know there's changes in the way that we needed to be doing education in like urban planning and yeah. engineering and things like this. Yeah, I would plus one everything you said um, from an academic perspective. I also think, um, we're very interested in the non-academic workforce, right? Like, do we all, if we're all really honest, do we all need a PhD to participate oh, yeah, no. yeah. in climate? Um, and so I think, how do we think about people that were formerly justice involved? How do you think about people that have been, um, you know, they're sort of the leftover from high impact degradation on land? Um, like, what is the career path to participate in a better way of moving forward. I'm from Southeast Iowa. There are no stoplights where I am from. Everyone in my family either works at a factory or some similar, or they have a, a fertilizer and grain hat that they work with. Everyone, you know, we have the highest cancer rates in the country. Like there aren't paths mm -hmm. for that. So I just wanna be the voice for people that don't have an academic path forward, but still have both a right and a value to participate in this, along with formerly justice involved individuals, which are a huge, huge opportunity to har harness for this. And I say that out loud without having the answers to that. So just wanted to flag that. Well, can I add to that? I think that's a terrific point. I mean, from a higher ed point of view, we're thinking about what kinds of coursework and learning experiences and things like that do we need for a degree? Um, but also incredibly important are not just universities, but other forms of learning too, like the, uh, the trades course. I love the idea of thinking about how do people in the workforce already uh, participate. Those are terrific points. I would just second everything that's been said so far. Um, and it's been really great in recent years and decades to see the increased focus on STEM education um, though we do need a lot more diversity of folks who are working um, in nature-based solutions, all, all forms of diversity, um, but also not just a focus on the technical element. Um, we need a lot more social scientists. We need a lot more people who can think interdisciplinarily. We need a lot of people who are, are science but trained in project management. Um, so I think it's really great to see among young people, especially the increased awareness um, and an interest in climate action, um, but also just being able to think holistically and flexibly and, and folks who can bring in all of those technical elements, but also the, the sort of human side of the equation. Thoughtful response. Okay, we'll go to the microphone if you could just say your name and then the question and we'll... Yes, uh, good morning, Luis Villanueva, DHS. Um, regarding something that was mentioned in, in the session, um, that sometimes it's better just to let, you know, give nature a space and, and not do anything. Um, I was wondering if you had any thoughts regarding legislation, uh, both like the Coastal Barrier Act, which uh, incentivizes uh, construction in, in certain coastal areas versus uh, legislation, for example, that, that is not as effective like uh, uh, federally backed insurance for uh, to build in coastal areas after, you know, they're devastated again and again. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, well, I'm, I'm not a policy expert, so I won't speak to specific legislation, um, but I will mention one area. So speaking from a, a global perspective versus specific US policies is I think there is a lot of opportunity um, speaking to NDCs, Nationally Determined Commitments to the Paris Climate Agreement, is a lot of countries need to actually codify those commitments into law or policy. Um, they need to enforce existing policies. There's a lot of great policies out there in the globe that just aren't being enacted or funded. Um, 
And then there's an, a need for, I'll call it ministerial coordination. Um, in the US, we might think about alignment of farm bill policy with um, you know, labor department and Bureau of Land Management policies. So just a little bit of that crosswalking and, and alignment and coordination among uh, policy and regulatory actors. Yeah, I'll, I'll add, I'm also not a policy person um, on purpose. I, I, I hang out with them sometimes. Um, I think there is a lot of policy need about what you can do where, uh, and um, quite of that has to do with land use and zoning policy. A lot of policy that I uh, am familiar with or that we are working to inform is um, we might think of as sort of agency implementation. So it's not necessarily the need for new legislation, it's about interpreting the way in which agencies have the autonomy and authority to implement their mission and vision and purpose and regulatory authority. So that might mean changes to forest management plans or um, ways in which we're using fire on the landscape or what, uh, how we incorporate climate into endangered species conservation. So many of these things are adjustments in implementation of existing policies as well as a need to uh, potentially create new policies. Um, I will ask for a Slido question. Our next online question is, what are your thoughts on federal versus state versus private or community ownership of these lands and how involved should local communities be in these processes and how can involvement be encouraged or incentivized? Well, can I just, uh, you, you're gonna have a lot to say about this, so I'll just say something. <laughs> Uh, we like to say on the adaptation space when we're deploying nature-based solutions that adaptation is ultimately very localized. So you must have community participation, community engagement, and there are critical dimensions of community ownership to sustaining successful adaptation projects. That said, the, um, when it comes to, say, land management, the federal government has a lot to say around uh, all parts of the United States and other governments in other uh, parts around the world. Um, I will just suggest that in the research dimension, we are working very hard to model what it means to collaborate across levels of government and across different sectors. To this point about the workforce needing to be interdisciplinary, we need to be figuring out how to approach nature-based solutions in a multi-factor, multi-sector, multidisciplinary way. So through the Climate Adaptation Science Centers, for example, we're pursuing research with the federal government, with state government, with tribal governments and municipal governments, the private sector, communities, in a variety of different higher education settings, and we are doing that research together. So in pursuing questions and possible solutions collaboratively, we're striving toward enabling implementation that would be uh, collaborative as well. I think uh, exactly the same, but from a money perspective. So <laughs> I, I, we, should pay. we play yeah. <laughs> with all of those um, pockets of money um, that don't play together always very well, but um, we have a huge bias from, you know, we're just some rounding error in the greater conversation, but from the transactions we put together, um, we have a huge bias towards localized um, benefit and investment and externalizing the cost, um, particularly where, where the community perhaps isn't the reason for um, degradation or the need for the investment. Um, so we, we tend to look at that a, pretty similarly from the, from the money perspective. That said, um, a lot of the work that we do around private lands and land conservation, um, there are some benefits to like dealing with a massive tract of federal land in the West versus in the East where, you know, the average forest ownership is like 100 acres. And so you're trying to like, oh my God, how do we get money into their pockets to do good things with these forests? And so then you've kind of got a pooled approach. So just from like logistics, there's, you know, some nuance of like, is it better to like deal with like one giant federal landowner? Um, but at the end of the day, all of our focus is to get 
the money into the most local pockets. And I think one thing we've seen from a policy perspective, as the current administration has put out a lot of climate money, is you are you get extra points for demonstrating community benefit, and you can't just check the box anymore. You actually have to you actually have to do it, which is hard, um, harder than saying you're doing it. So we're seeing a much greater emphasis at the state and federal level as money and philanth uh, philanthropic for sure um, has a greater push towards um, not just giving um, some organization money to do a thing but really that collaborative approach to investments. Uh, at the microphone, please. Yes. <clears throat> Good morning, and thank you for this excellent panel. My name is Will Beach, and I lead the Climate Preparedness and Resilience Program for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. The Army Corps is committed to integrating nature-based solutions. It's one of General Spellman's top priorities. It's all over our climate adaptation plan. But we find we're having a challenge when it comes to the scale of the solution. Um, we are usually not involved at the scale of, say, municipal stormwater management. We're usually dealing with coastal storm risk management or riverine flood risk management. We know how to restore ecosystems, and we can certainly talk about all the ancillary benefits of recreation and habitat and air and water quality and so forth. What we find, though, is that our partners in New York or Miami or Houston are asking us for flood risk management that would be equivalent to, say, a 10-foot flood wall, but they want it to come from frictional features like floodplain forests or oyster reefs or what have you. We can do that, but we're going to need either vast amounts of real estate to get that kind of performance, or we're going to need the regulatory agencies to let us fill in a lot of open water with forests or, or whatever you like. So. We're finding that the scale issue is, is becoming something of a challenge. And just like we can't block a flood with a one foot flood wall, we also can't block it with 50 feet of, of trees. So I'm interested in any sort of ideas or thoughts about how do we implement nature-based solutions at scale? Yeah. Well, as someone who has tried very much to work with US Army Corps of Engineer money, for a while, not super successfully. I will see you after class. Um, <laughs> um, but I would also say, this isn't a black and white, it's not either birds and bunnies or nothing, right? So this mixture between nature and gray infrastructure, um, at my core, I come from a wastewater background. I love it, it's like my bread and butter, I love wastewater, but trees are never going to carry our wastewater for us. So I think thinking about this a little bit more integrated also makes us um, have a little bit more integrity as we're talking to communities and presenting them with options, is it's not either, um, you know, we remove the city and put a bunch of trees there, which frankly, in some places, you know, winter's coming, you know, but um, but it's not either we do that or we do nothing but put houses on stilts and build a fortress around the city that will last for you know more than two floods from now. So I think thinking about like this, um, I, I find that helpful from a money perspective of saying it's not either or, but it can be um, a mixture. That was gonna be exactly my response that I think the scale question is fascinating. I think we have so much sort of general public awareness about what are the, when are nature-based solutions a particularly powerful tool? I think when they come from these co-benefits, when they enable us to do uh, biodiversity conservation and when they're successful at achieving our goals, but they won't be necessarily achieve, a, especially a flood control goal all by itself. But what I think is so powerful about the way the Army Corps has really changed its perspective, including this, um, these adaptation manuals, is that when the Corps sh shows up at a conversation with a potential set of nature-based solutions on the table in dialogue with the community, that is a huge change and a fundamental shift. And it might not be you know, reforestation across half of North America, um, nor is that necessarily what we're striving toward, uh, but it is in the toolbox, and that is a major game changer from my perspective, having worked in this area for a long time. And I would, I would always 
want to be looking for when there's a project opportunity, where, where it is feasible to make sure that there is some opportunity to deploy nature-based solutions, even though in most cases it might not wholly meet, especially a flood control uh, type of solution. Uh, well, I totally feel your pain. Yeah. I think <laughs> pace and scale are the biggest challenges that we have in this space. Um, and I'll just mention a little bit more about what we've been doing with the prototyping network that I mentioned earlier. Um, so bringing investment to capacity building and, and research and data in order to um, improve monitoring and evaluation practices, improve carbon accounting of even understanding what are the, the impacts and outcomes of these projects, uh, facilitate cross-learning, better understand success and failure factors, and all of this feeding into adaptive management to improve project performance and, and increase pace and scale. But that's still all the long game. So I think it's, it's everything these folks said and just still that sort of slowly chipping away at this, this cross-learning so we build more global capacity and knowledge and ability to implement nature-based solutions. And in terms of the capacity piece, I think there's also a, um, you know, workforce and um, supply angle as well that if, for example, normally if I'm, I'm speaking about forest restoration, I might advocate for a more natural process of just letting trees grow back than tree planting, which is often not that successful. But sometimes we need to do those big tree planting campaigns. And guess what? we have no seedling stock available because we haven't invested in nurseries five years ago or don't have the pipeline to get the plants from A to B. So I think it's a lot of that, um, you know, both and in addition to the long-term investment in, in the pipeline of everything that we know we need to do moving forward. And thank you, Army Corps, for even caring about this and, and wanting to move forward with this progressive way of uh, attacking the issues. Uh, Slido question? This is going to be our final Slido question so we can prioritize the people in the room. Um, but our next online question is, there are particular funding challenges around such squishy subjects as trust and community. How much do our grant funding mechanisms need to change and how much do we need to develop better metrics to make things less squishy? Um, I'll start on this one, and I, I really appreciate this question. Um, I'll say, from what I've seen from funders the last few years, there's a huge interest in supporting community benefits um, and indigenous and community self-determination. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity here. Um, but I'll, I'll just go back to what I mentioned previously around having flexibility in project deployment. Um, I've seen in a lot of grant proposals, like you write so much information, you have to have a ton of detail in what your activities and outcomes and indicators are going to be, and you spend so much time developing the proposal that you don't feel like you have time to do the darn work. Um, so I think just a little bit more of that room for flexibility and adaptive management in terms of being really clear on what the, the goal or desired outcome is and, and having a sense of the strategies but then being able to kind of build the, the project and be adaptable and be flexible to some of those challenging circumstances that I mentioned earlier around, um, you know, there was a, a flood or a change in government and the project had to totally reevaluate what they were doing, having within those granting mechanisms flexibility to do that without feeling like you're failing to achieve your grant, um, what you've been granted to achieve. And what I would just add from a philanthropic point of view is um, trust takes a long time to build and, and you need to build it way in advance of a hiccup. Um, I, I used to say from the Judeo-Christian thing to my kids, it wasn't raining when Noah built the ark. And so I, when I was at private foundations, I found it very important to establish rapport and a relationship with the grantee because in two and a half years when something goes wrong and their supply is no longer there or whatever, they need to be able to come to me face to face and just lay it on the line and tell me what's up so that we can then figure out what's the next pathway, what's the next best thing to do. And so I think at least in private philanthropy, having those trust relationships are a key part of successfully deploying the money. So um, there's my two cents. Why don't we go, so I'm gonna tell you this, we have five minutes to 
get through the questions in the room. So we may do them a little bit more rapidly yeah. and, and then we'll have a little five minute wrap up or so because um, we are now between you and lunch. So go ahead. I appreciate your work and your presence today. I'm Shandon Black with a startup supporting academic research. And Sarah, you brought up initially the importance of preventing uh, GHG emissions before they happen. And that's definitely something I think about a lot, but it's challenging to think of solutions. And so I'm looking for some uh, creativity, inspiration on potential examples or ideas you may have to achieve reducing emissions before they are created. Um. Well, this is a really good and tough question. Thank you. Um, one, I would say, is what we mentioned previously around valuation of those systems, both for their climate benefits and any other benefits that they may have. Um, and then two, I would say understanding those systems. So I'll mention um, it's another peatlands project. I'm biased, but we do have great projects in agroforestry and um, coastal wetlands but a peatlands project in Angola in Western Africa, um, where it's sort of known there may be some, some peat deposits in this area, but it's a post-conflict landscape. There hasn't been uh, you know, a lot of research done in that area or on that ecosystem. So even just being able to work with a multidisciplinary, multinational team to get a better sense of where those peat deposits are and what those carbon stocks are, and then work with the national government of Angola to really build capacity of those policymakers to understand and value the peat resources. And then in parallel, working with the local community so they understand and value the peat resources or they you know, obviously have a sense of the values, but maybe not in terms of, of global climate, but then co-developing activities with those folks that will increase their livelihoods and, and give them a little bit more stability. Um, so I definitely don't have all the answers to you on that front, but I would say just from those experiences, um, both understanding and valuing the, the power of our natural systems at all scales from local to national to international is at least one way to, to start getting to the, the avoided emissions that we need. Um, thank you for your patience. We'll go ahead with the next question. Hi, I'll be quick. Um, I'm Catherine Clark, I'm with Community Assistance in FEMA. Um, we spoke a little bit about some of the challenges that NDS is encountering, so scale, funding. So my question is, how can we integrate it into gray infrastructure policies and procedures that already exist? So how can we address those gaps moving forward? It's a good question. So the question is how to incorporate nature-based solutions into gray infrastructure a little bit better. Um, I, I, we see some challenges around how um, regulatory um, programs uh, accept um, anything that's not a straight engineered solution. Um, and this is um, speaking from sort of um, not necessarily your flood walls or your resilience infrastructure, but really thinking about um, kind of the gray infrastructure that's in you know water, wastewater, stormwater at the local level. Um, so it's pretty easy to get acceptance around um, gray infrastructure and the valuation. It's almost like um, it's accepted that the gray infrastructure works. And then there has to be this further demonstration for anything that's sort of green. And so I do think there's some work to be done around that regulatory environment. Um, I am not a huge fan of benefit cost analysis. I don't mean to make anyone clutch their pearls in this room. But, um, but I do think, um, you know, part of our bias is, you know, it, really when you do look at the benefit cost analysis of nature-based solutions together, so um, it tends to be cheaper and a better way for communities to be able to afford their needs. So um, if there's anyone that has a simplified version of that, um, I, I think that is also an important way to look at it. Frankly, there's some chain that we haven't really quite figured out how to break, which is a community tends to work with one, two, or three local engineers yeah. when a problem breaks. Um, and it's sort of in the name. I love engineers. Um, some of my best friends are engineers, probably. But, um, but it, what an engineer tends to give is an engineered solution. 
And so this kind of goes back to the like, what's the workforce? What's the yeah. training retraining that needs to happen? Is some of it's on the regulatory side, but when you've got a community that's uh, led, you know, got a board that's like three volunteers that are leading the decisions in the town, they're going to outsource that trust to someone that they know, which almost 99% of the time is an engineer. So there's something in that chain that if we could kind of think about that, like what's that change agent of providing additional resources that complement that, I haven't solved that, but that's but that tends to be a challenge. I agree. I think those a lot of those consulting and contracting firms, the worst. Uh, they, well, they're responding to regulation, right? That's something they have to comply yeah. with, but they're offering a lot more and putting a lot more on the table than just meeting those regulatory guidelines. And there's a lot of wiggle room around uh, workforce development and yeah. the sort of creative thinking in that community. Thank you very much. I work in community assistance, so I loved hearing the community perspective. Thank you. Thank you. The final question, and thank you for your patience. Thank you so much, and thanks for this fantastic conversation. I'm Lauren Westenberg. I'm a counsel with the Senate Committee on Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry. Um, work on a lot of federal programs that help look at nature-based solutions at the Department of Agriculture, um, as well as with the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, I'm curious, you've all talked about working with governmental partners at the state, the local, the federal level. I'm curious what characteristics of those partners help make them more of a benefit than a hindrance to getting these types of forward-thinking projects on the ground. I'll just say um, interest, right? Interest in saying we get that we can't change the, the, the whole game on a dime. Federal agencies, even state agencies, are big ships that don't turn immediately. But where we see change is let's have a conversation. How can we re-examine our stodgy old rules, like blow some dust on those books? And like, what's a way that we can think about playing with the existing conditions? Um, and do something interesting. So for example, um, USDA is one of our largest water outcomes buyers, meaning we've done an intervention for a farmer, we've calculated the impacts, we've sent an agronomist on the ground to make sure that farmer Jessica did she, what she said she would do. And then USDA is one of our largest outcomes buyers in a number of our transactions. So we've seen immense creativity around NRCS and being willing to like, let's, let's play ball here. We're increasingly seeing that interest around um, programs that um, have some flexibility. So for example, EPA's state revolving funds are largely allotment programs that are led by states. EPA doesn't have a whole lot of teeth in those programs to make them change. It's just the way they were built. They're very state led. But, but EPA does have control over WIFIA, for example. And that WIFIA team is like, all right, we don't have the answers. Everything in our program was not built for anything that you guys are trying to do. But let's have that conversation and talk. Let's, we're not going to solve it. We're not going to just write a check or solve an issue. But like, really in an air of like, let's brainstorm. And what do we on the ground with the community, what do we have to accept as the thing versus what is the federal entity willing to in, almost like reinterpret or reimagine. Um, so we've seen that play out in a ton of conversation, but from a like what's actually happened, um, we have a couple of shining stars and then we have a couple of like, we feel like we just talk in a bubble. Um, so I think that openness to like collaborate and reimagine their programs is just so helpful. I know we're almost out of time, but this is such a good question. I want to let both Jessica and Sarah, I think they both have something to add. And then I'm going to ask the panelists in 10 seconds to give a takeaway <laughs> so that we can finish the question. Go ahead. I think um, the, the current um, role that the federal government is playing is very productive and help, helpful. I'm going to speak on the adaptation side and with specific most knowledge in that sort of natural resource, nature-based space. The orientation of the federal government to being open for business and having financing and wanting to be a good partner to state, tribal, and local governments is very helpful and uh, influential. 
the state comes to the table when there are matching funds available, the enthusiasm level for engaging in the adaptation work given the availability of federal funds is um, substantial, at least in my home state and other states that I work with in the Midwest. And I would say local governments, they're open for business. They are customers. They are um, in the adaptation realm less problematic and more just desiring of assistance um, and participation. And uh, so I do think that the federal government's positioning on nature-based solutions has a, a significant trickle-down effect to these other um, players and participants. Um, in the, the nonprofit conservation world, we spend a lot of time figuring out where to work, the exact place on the map that we can optimize our outcomes. But we found time and again, it's not so much where you work, but who you work with. You have to find your local champions. If we had more time, I'd tell a story about an amazing rancher um, in Guatemala. But really finding that having these local champions, whether it's among the community, whether it's a person in a particular government department office, um, finding those champions who can spread your message for you. So I would say, you know, just having that flexibility of maybe you go to one person and, and there's not a right immediate click. Maybe there's another person in that office or you start with a different department and agency and, and keep going till you find your local champion and enlist them to help you um, spread the word. And then also knowing your audience of, like we talked about, it may be a, a nature first or climate first approach. It may be water, it may be community livelihoods or whatever, um, being able to have sort of your full spectrum of information on the table and, and pick and choose the messages that you need that are gonna speak most to your intended audience. Thank you. Okay, don't clap yet. What a wonderful audience you've been. What a wonderful panel it's been. While they're thinking of their 10 second sound bite of what they want you to take away, I have to give you a couple of announcements. Um, after this, we're gonna have a break for 75-ish minutes and we're going to eat and um, be at different tables based on the subject areas. Uh, at 1.30 to 2.45, one of the breakout sessions will be nature's role in adapting to the future. And so you may want to continue listening and learning there. There'll also be a, a main stage panel like we've had on the future of transboundary water management. So. 10 seconds, take away from each 10 of seconds, you. I'm gonna say innovation. Um, when we think about nature-based solutions, both mitigation and adaptation, we need new ideas, we're figuring it out. And I'm inspired to think that after listening to the AI panel where we're super interesting, we're all very enamored with AI, lots of innovation technology, it's great. We need as much innovation or technology and creative ways of thinking in this space as any other. I love that. Um, I think the thing that I would add is that um, we're talking about communities, and a community is like, what's that? Right? How do you define a community? But we might be talking at, at the issue level, but communities don't feel climate in a single issue way. So I was here a few months ago, and you know, I, I think I might have said this then. Um, I always like to think of the poet Audre Lorde that says, there's no such thing as a single issue struggle because none of us lead single issue lives. So this is like when we, from a money side, are saying like, what are what is the outcomes from a multi-dimensional way? Just always remembering that our communities are feeling this through jobs and water and heat and home values and taxes and buying bread and, um, and that means there are all kinds of ways to solve these problems from the innovative approach. Go ahead. I'll take the opportunity to underscore a point that was made in the last session around data access. Um, we need more data, more transparency of data, um, reduced publication fees, and especially reduced open access publication fees. Um, and then just in general, I would say nature-based solutions are largely available now, they're largely cost effective, and they largely have multiple benefits for uh, a range of parties. So we should invest in them more greatly. Thank you. So Sarah Levitt, T. Thomas, Jessica Hellman, it's been a privilege to hear these experts share their knowledge with us. Let's thank them and.